Hello and welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep. I'm your host, Grace Helbig. Very excited for you to experience this conversation that I have with Sabrina Benayme here on Not Too Deep. She is a writer, performer, slam poet. Maybe you know her from the viral video of her poem, Explaining My Depression to My Mother, back in 2014. If you haven't seen it, whew, I highly recommend it. She's got a new poetry book out now called I Love You, Call Me Back. It was just released at the end of October, available now. Go get your ears, eyes, face, soul on it. The description of the book is unfurling over the course of one month in 2020 in 75 original poems. I Love You, Call Me Back grapples with mental health struggles and the uncertainty of the moment and beyond. She is absolutely lovely. We talk about the world of slam poetry, um, dealing with mental health issues uh, during a pandemic, especially her beautiful long haired wiener <laughs> maybe the babe it's her dog and uh also we get into some nitty-gritty of bachelor in paradise and survivor all of the natural things so please enjoy this episode of not too deep with sabrina benayme <laughs> I have so many questions for you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, how how are you doing, first of all? I am wonderful. It is so wonderful to be here with you. Oh, that's so great. Well, you have, um, this has been a big, well, when this comes out, the desk will have settled a little bit, but this is a big week for you. You have a new book out. Yes, a brand new book. I love you, Call Me Back. Yes, so- I love it. Now, how do you, you're a poet, storyteller, performer, all of these things. How do you describe the new book? Is it a collection of poetry? Is it a collection of short stories, et cetera? Yeah, it's a poetry collection for sure, but it takes place over the course of a month. So it's got a little bit more narrative than okay. most, I would say. And so talk me through how you conceptualize this, because over the course of a month, is that always the time frame? that you had set in place to write poetry? No, okay. No, not at all. Um, These poems kind of came together over the course of a few years. But last year in quarantine, I really had to sit down and scrap half of this book and sit down and be like, what am I doing? What am I trying to make? And that's when it, it came up. My mom's diagnosis came up around the same time. So it felt like something that was urgent that had to be written about. And then the narrative of the month just became an easy, an easier way to structure um, and organize my thoughts. Totally. And I feel like that also speaks to, I think, a lot of artists over the last year that sit down and go, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> Moment. <laughs> what am I trying to say? And how am I organizing all of my thoughts around it? Um, but I, I want to go back in time a little bit and and hear about how you got into poetry, into slam poetry, into that world in general. Where did that start? Yeah. So I, I always wrote poems kind of secretly. Um, okay. Growing up, I was pretty emo. I actually would post them <laughs> on a dashboard confessional poetry forum. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, anonymously, which is pretty fun. I but it wasn't that. until I was like 23 and I had a tumor in my throat the size of a squash ball. And wow. My best friend turned to me and was like, oh, yeah, well, you did that to yourself from swallowing all those things and emotions and feelings you've been writing all these years. And that really freaked me out. So (laughs) that led me to take a spoken word workshop, which just like got the ball rolling in performance poetry. Wow. And what a hauntingly poetic thing for your friend to say (laughs) about (laughs) this situation. No. Okay. When you took your first poetry workshop or or class, what's that like for people that don't really know? Because I think at least my mom writes a lot of poetry, but poetry to me has always been this very, um, this upper echelon of like writing artistry that really intimidates me. So what was that experience like for you? Poetry to me has always felt like this language I maybe made up. Okay. And I know I did it, but maybe I did, you know, yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. how my poems feel. And so it's kind of, it was a different feeling to go to a class and be like, oh, maybe there's a lot of people that speak this language. Like I could not be the only one. And that's yeah. a pretty exciting feeling. Sorry. My dog is so neat. Oh, is that Mabe um, the Babe right <laughs> that there? That is Mabe the Babe right there. Oh, okay. There oh, She'll pop what, up. Well, that's my other question is what's the origin story of you and Mabe the Babe? 
Maeve the Babe is my dream dog. I always <laughs> wanted a long haired wiener. Um, <laughs> They're just the best. Um, I love how when she walks, her little hair is like um, a little skirt. Um, yeah, I'm obsessed. So when I got her three years ago. <gasps> That's so great. Yeah, they are wiener dogs in general have such a um, funny way about them because they have no awareness of how hilarious they look in the world just existing naturally. I'm convinced she doesn't think she's small. Like, I think she thinks she's a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. Oh, God. What inspiring uh, kind of life essence to live by. um there's also okay so you take this class and then in is it 2014 you have this viral video explaining my depression to my mother that blows up talk to us about how you go from taking this class just to try and get yourself figured out to that moment so from the class i went to a poetry slam in toronto which led me to try to get on the Toronto Poetry Slam team, which I did in 2014. What's that and like? How do you get on the team? Are there auditions? Do you prepare? So you There's slams. That's okay. what slams are. They're like competitions. And mm-hmm. basically you go through rounds and by audience vote, the winner has the highest score all three rounds and like makes it through to the end. Wow. And then you get points every time you win or come second or third. And they compile those points at the end of the season and those people compete for the team. And if you make it on the team, what that means is you compete um, at representing Toronto at the Canadian National Slam competition and the American National Slam competition. So that's where Explaining My Depression to My Mother was filmed in Oakland when we performed there. Okay, gotcha. And I mean, you're going in with the best intentions. And this thing blows up. That must be such a complicated feeling because it's such, you know, personal uh, storytelling and it's such, you know, beautiful and deep and complex and like very like transparent, like you're all out there. Was that like, how? what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was overwhelming. So I had not it wasn't a known thing that I had depression um, before this poem was out in the world. And it was months later that it went up on the internet from when it was performed. So when they had asked me if I wanted to give them permission, I was like, sure. I don't remember that at all. How bad could it have been? (laughs) Right. And then I watched it and I was like, holy shit, it's really bad. (laughs) Um, But it also kind of makes it all the more authentic that I'm genuinely having a panic attack while performing this poem about mental illness. So yeah, when it went viral, it really was overwhelming and it was complicated because in one way it felt great and relieving to have this out about me. And then on the flip of that, like my own friends and family are calling me being like, why didn't you tell me you felt like this? Really? Why didn't you talk about this before? Yeah. Wow. So that's just a whole chaotic field. After <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, so then you you do this and then uh, you also have coached the team right in Toronto? I did, yes. Okay, so what what do you what do you look for? What do you strive for when you're performing as a slam poet and also when you're coaching other poets? I think you're just always looking for authenticity at the end mm-hmm. of the day in any kind of art. You're just looking for that thing that represents somebody and what they're trying to say in poetry, what they're trying to say so authentically to them sure. that it's kind of undeniable. You're striving for authenticity. Which is such a buzzword in and of, you know, internet culture, digital content, all of that. And it's one of those words that I am so fascinated by because you really can't teach it. It's like an essence of someone that you hope to get, I guess, like bring out in people. Yeah. Uh, what? Because you also teach workshops now, too, right? I do. OK, so how do you even like cultivate that in someone other than just like, trying to build their self-esteem for who they are. Honestly, that's all you're doing is giving them tips and tools to help them build that back up and create that kind of expression that feels safe to do. Yeah. Okay. On top of that, is there a, uh, a way to just, is, is 
Canada's slam poetry scene, does it have a, a certain essence to it or a vibe to it that's different than other countries? Um, I, I think it, it's hard for me to say, I haven't been in the slam scene for years and okay. I, I don't really know what it looks like now, but at the time, Canada's teams, I think just had a lot more fun in a really? way. Like, yeah. yeah, like I don't think it was as competitive. I think it was a lot more fun and a lot more silliness involved. I love that. Yeah. Cause I wonder if, you know, like, in entertainment, it can be very cutthroat and very like competitive that I wonder if the slam poetry world is so much more supportive because everyone like poetry is so beautiful and a great way to express yourself and to communicate in words that you don't normally communicate in in everyday life. Yeah, I want that to be true, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just like any other um, artist based community where there's going to be those undertones of like maybe um, competition or maybe mm. that feeling of like, oh, there's not, there's not a ton of exposure. I want to be the first to get it. Or I want to, maybe sure. there's not enough room for everybody, you know, which there of course is, but sure, sure, sure. Is there, do you have to switch off a part of your brain from seeing the whole world in poetry sometimes? Um, <laughs> n- yes and no, I don't think I like to switch it off. Yeah, I think yeah, I yeah. prefer to keep it on yeah. and just be on it all the time. But I think sometimes it's like a blessing and a curse because somebody's talking to you and you you're writing a poem. Right. <laughs> you're like, you just told me, or you're you're like, remember that quote. So you could write it down and yeah, yeah, or yeah. like you actively get out your notebook and start being like, I'm so sorry, I have to steal that. That was really good. <laughs> yeah. That goes with this other thing that's you know, so it's a, it's kind of hard to turn it off. Um, because in a way it makes life more fun and exciting to like explore the day that way. And more beautiful. The, um, that goes into, I was going to ask about your writing process. Do you have a particular process or do you kind of keep all avenues of the brain and creativity open at all times in case? I definitely have my like writing hours where I Mm -hmm. sit and work regardless of what I'm doing outside of that. Like I have a couple hours a day that I kind of sit and just write, Mm -hmm. but I think it's important to kind of stretch your rubber band in every direction. So sometimes writing also looks like going for a walk or Mm. it looks like washing something or, you know, just doing something out of your comfort zone. Yeah. What, what do you watch? Ooh, what do I watch? Lately, I've been, it's so embarrassing, but I'm very excited about The Bachelorette and Survivor <laughs> being back. Yes, so I just that's... started the new season of Survivor. Uh, we're on the same page and it's not embarrassing. It is entertainment and it's uh, it's a great, I think, case study in human behavior. <laughs> yeah, and relationships, right? Yes. Like, it's it's very cool. Uh, I'm so happy to hear that. I, uh, I'm waiting for the next episode of Survivor. Um, I'm still just getting into it. It's the fastest season that they've done. Jeff Probst to me is one of the greatest hosts that's existed on time tele- yes, ever. Yes, yes. yes, absolutely. The way it's, he's grown with us. His ability to facilitate constructive conversation blows my mind every single time he does it. Yep. <laughs> um, okay. Did you feel like there was a pressure to keep up this virality situation that happened after the the slam poetry competition in 2014 or do you with the, the new book especially just keep it moving and like you said just connect to your authenticity about what you're feeling and what you're experiencing at the time well i was lucky after um the poem went viral to get a a book contract. So I got to finish my first book and tour that book Mm. this time around touring is much less possible. I though you are doing it and I think that is awesome, but it must be challenging. It's in, I mean, it does play. And I'm so curious about touring with the poetry books. I assume that the audience is extremely polite. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's definitely different. You kind of have to break the ice yourself a little bit and put jokes or, or something. You need to have another shtick outside of your poems to kind of keep things moving. I feel Um, and bring the energy, keep the energy up. But this time around, it's a little bit different. I don't feel the same 
um, like outward push. I'm not going on tour. I'm not doing shows and building a show around it. So it feels really different yeah. to be kind of in this new world, having art out. Well, it also, I mean, which is kind of interesting because it speaks to like how everyone I think is feeling about right now, which is like, are we doing this right? Is yeah, this it's, is- it's hard to feel any pressure because you're just like, I don't even know. Is this how we do things now? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Is there, I've recently heard um, that reading poetry books, um, I have this teacher that was talking about reading them backwards, forwards start in the middle, like read kind of like chaotically through, like there's no necessarily right way to read a poetry book. Do you agree with that? Do you think that, or the your new book, is it best to read from start to finish? Yeah, that's like, I think that could be chaotically bad or good um, yeah. <laughs> reading it in any direction it's like listening to an album on shuffle like some yeah, people might true. be like that's the wrong way to do it <laughs> um and some people will be like hey I'm like that so I don't know I personally think I always want to take something in the way someone gave it to me first so mm. I'm gonna read the book front to back for the first um kind of introduction to it but then yeah like revisit it however feels right to you I think I would prefer people read it front to back personally because I like I like put effort into a narrative and hope that shows just because it is a chronological book this time yeah well what um what do you if you have any specificities of what do you hope people get out of your new book or what what do you hope they recognize with the new book especially because from 2014 to now or what seven years later like you as a human being have grown so much. Like, is there something in particular that you hope people recognize or connect with? This time around, I really tried to focus on like exploring joy through Mm. those difficult times when you're navigating mental illness or you're navigating grief, how to kind of explore joy through that. And Mm -hmm. so I'm really hoping people can read this book and feel either seen by what the content is or feel compelled to like take that into their own life and find joy in maybe places they wouldn't necessarily look. Oh, that's freaking beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, I have a bunch more questions for you. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Hi, friends. Grace Helbig here from the podcast Not Too Deep, which you are currently listening to, hosted by me, Grace Helbig. Just wanted to say a couple of things. One, thank you so much for listening. And two, if you are enjoying yourself to such a degree that you'd love to leave us a um, review on the Apple Store, that would be so appreciated. Because again, you are very appreciated for giving us your time, your ears, your attention, whatever it may be. Uh, And that was my couple of things. Now back to me, me. So you're doing all of these events and promotional stuff online so people can connect with you virtually. Virtually. Yep. Sweet. Okay. Um, Do you plan on going back on tour out in the real world at some point when it's safe and okay? Yes, absolutely. I think the spring is okay. kind of what I'm hoping for. Sweet. And are you teaching more classes coming up soon? Yeah, it looks like I will be um, sometime in the winter season, but we don't have dates quite yet. Love it. Okay, so people can just follow you and keep up with when and if that happens. Totally. Awesome. Okay, um, Sabrina, I'm going to get into the two questions I ask every single guest that is on the podcast with me. And the first is, Who, alive or dead, would you most like to throw cold spaghetti at? Oh, that's such a good one because I feel like so many people's faces just flashed before me. Um, I like to add on that this is only your answer right now in this moment. This is an answer that can change constantly. I think I would honestly throw (laughs) this is so so mean but so funny I think I would throw cold spaghetti at maybe like a couple members in my family right now because I had yeah I had like a a little blip of a moment where I I don't like to get mad 
And it's not something I do, but if I had the opportunity to like in a fun way be mad, I think yeah. I would absolutely take it right now and throw that spaghetti. I love that. I think I know what you're talking about. Was this something you tweeted about recently? It was, yes. Okay. Are you comfortable sharing this? Yeah, absolutely. I, I woke up... Because um, it's also on your Twitter for everyone. Yeah, it's in the world. <laughs> um, I woke up on my book release day and like half of the day went by and then I realized my entire family forgot it was my book release day. <laughs> and so I called... And it, like the book is about my mom. So I, I called my mom. I was like, did you forget that today's the day? And she's like, yes. <laughs> and I was like, Oh no. Um, and so that was a bummer. And I try really hard not to get mad. I obviously was quite upset um, yeah. that morning, but I'm trying to like loose out of that feeling. But I think if I could just throw some spaghetti, I'd probably get over it quicker. Yeah. And that would send the message to them without any like major rifts in the whole family <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, on top of that, I'm so curious because you know, so much of um, or at least, you know, when you look at your stuff on a very simple basis, a lot of it is in relationship with your mom. Mm -hmm. um, how how do you put that into your work? It, it, do you like have to think about what's OK, like how much and how um, intimate to get in that in your work? Or do you just put it all out there? I think I think about it in terms of like, how will this affect our relationship? Mm. Like, is this something we haven't already discussed? Maybe we should talk about this in real life first. Uh, but yeah. I kind of come from a family of oversharers. So <laughs> it's like my mom would kind of tell you more probably than sure. I would even feel comfortable <laughs> telling you. So it seems like what I do seems okay for her. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if because she was uh, in in so many of your pieces if she felt like, please stop talking about me. <laughs> no, I think I think deep down she loves it. And she's like, include a photo of me next time. <laughs> <laughs> Put a face to the name yeah. so that people can stop me in the street. Um, okay, the second question that I ask every single guest that's here on the podcast is to tell us your worst pants shooting story um, or like a bathroom emergency situation but you can only use three words or like small phrases. Um, so for example, mine is college jogging front lawn. Ooh, mine is definitely period airplane, mm -hmm. no sweater to tie around. <laughs> <laughs> that is also yeah that is the life hack that we all go to i just look at how many layers am i wearing and what can i make out of this clothing into different clothing <laughs> i just had to run <laughs> i just had to walk as fast as i could <laughs> oh gosh okay no follow-up questions there i think that really paints a picture um okay now we're going to move into the portion that's called deep and hot where i'm going to ask you a deep question that we have prepared for you um, and for a hot take on uh, like a concept or idea that might come to mind for you. Um, so the deep question is, are you learning from your mistakes? Yes. And I think my therapist would agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely trying. I feel like you talk so candidly about mental health. Um, do you, what are your best practices that you put into place? Because I also deal with depression and anxiety. And, and I know that when I first started making videos online, that became a real, um, hot button for authenticity of people opening up about those kind of private struggles. So for you, do you have systems in place for yourself? I do. I find talking about it uh, really taking the shame away from it for myself mm. helps quite a yeah. bit. Um, but I also go to therapy. I'm on medication. I have my support systems that I have in my life always that are consistent. So that's really helpful. And I make a lot of to-do lists that I think oh. is really helpful in organizing an anxious mind. I uh, agree. I'm looking at my to-do list to the left of my computer right now. Yeah. Um, are you still on the dashboard confessional forum? <laughs> no i don't think it exists anymore or else i probably would be truly dang i'm like get the uh resurgence going oh also quick question about like are there online areas that you recommend for people 
um, that are interested in poetry? Are there like um, sites or, or, or things that you use online to kind of connect with people in different ways there? Yeah. Button poetry is wonderful. If you go yeah. on YouTube and find them, they're also running workshops now, which is great. Awful Good Writers is another um, place that you can go to look for workshops that are taking, but also just, you know, looking up your favorite writers and then looking up their favorite writers. And you can mm. always find who's running a workshop, who's doing something virtually, um, a reading, anything. There's so much of it right now. That's so cool. Well, on that same kind of um, token, uh, our hot take for you is does do you think social media helps or hinders a poet hot take is that I love <laughs> social media okay, okay I think it's really helpful as long as you have personal boundaries with it in yeah. like your own day-to-day -day use of it I think if you're using it to connect with people it's only helpful like I haven't I think if you're coming from a place where you stay in your lane you don't like try to go all over and be a, a be all end all to, you know, anything. You just do what you know and stick to it and share what feels comfortable with you. It could only help you. That's really great. Do you have a particular platform that you prefer over others? Um, so to ingest, I like Twitter, like okay. Twitter is my go to. I just think it's fun um, to read people's wild takes on the internet <laughs> yeah, yeah. and People I also love wild takes <laughs> I also love watching like the bachelor while being on bachelor twitter <gasps> I think that's one of the best experiences I've yeah I am a huge real housewives fan and uh only in the last year have I started indulging in the hashtag conversation after every episode and it is I mean, the boldness that people have to put <laughs> their opinions and memes out there is so uh, it brings me joy and also makes me go, oh, shit, that's really yeah. mean what they just said. Yeah, but there, I, I find there's more clever people than mean people usually. Yes, that so is that's always nice. That is the intimidating factor. I'm like, everyone is the funniest person I've ever <laughs> seen all the time. Did you watch Bachelor in Paradise? I did. Thoughts on the, the ending of it? I, so I many engagements. Season, <laughs> so many engagements. And I found this season kind of boring. Okay, I wanted thank you. Yeah, me it too. To be better. I, I, don't uh, I don't know if they were trying to shoot in like a much shorter time frame than they normally do or what, but everything felt a little like uh, they didn't, they were really riling up Demi the whole season. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like they knew that she was the only one that they could get to say literally the most crazy things. And they just kept trying to poke the bear with her the whole time. And she she was like down. She yeah. was like, I'll do it if you guys need me to. <laughs> <laughs> give me a birthday cake. I'll go down yeah. and celebrate a random birthday for someone I don't give an actual shit about. Uh, would you ever go on a reality program? No, because I think the idea of kissing in front of a camera is the cringiest. Yeah. Like I could go for most of it and be okay with it, but it's <sighs> the kissing. No. Oh. <laughs> and they do it like it's a handshake. Like yeah. it's a <laughs> everyone is kissing everyone all the time. But would you go on a show that's not like a dating reality show? That's like a, let's say, uh, like Amazing Race. Are there any other reality shows that you would even consider? Or Survivor? I think, yeah, I, I would love to go on Survivor, though really? I don't think I would make it very far. <laughs> like, I'm not athletic. I'm like, I show all my cards. Like, I don't I don't think I would make it far, but I would love to be on Survivor just to be like the person they kick off first. Uh, but I also feel like, you, by you being just completely honest and upfront the whole time would yeah, throw they everyone they would throw I mean that would throw everyone into a tailspin of being like is she lying she's <laughs> telling us everything this must be a trap I get like one puzzle right one time and I'm a hero like that's <laughs> truly my my narrative on Survivor I'm okay with that I know they always tout themselves as being amazing at puzzles and then they're given literally <laughs> a puzzle and they're like I don't know what to do Oh my goodness. Have you picked up other than working on your book this uh, throughout the course of the pandemic? Have you picked up other pandemic hobbies at all? Um, hobbies? I tried to do 
a few things like okay. watercolor paint or Ooh. things that where I don't do that just like could be fun, but I'm not artistic in any other way. <laughs> and it just is frustrating to like paint when you're bad at painting or, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like use pastels if you're just oh. like smudging your fingers everywhere. So 100%. I didn't really pick up any hobbies, but I did start listening to ASMR to fall asleep. So okay. you're an ASMR person. Now I am. Yes. Okay. I haven't, I guess, broken my seal on it. I'm still at the level where it makes me cringe and makes me uncomfortable. That's probably my own weird boundaries and like uh, fear of intimacy, et cetera. I'm working on that with my therapist. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like levels of it. Like I really like just like tapping on things. Okay. No talking, just like the sound of tapping. It's <laughs> like rain, but yeah. not. It's very nice. I don't know. Do you have a favorite ASMR art artist, I guess? I do. Weirdly enough, this girl, Tina. Tina. Um, <laughs> Tina ASMR. <laughs> T-E-N-A ASMR. I love her. I don't know what it is. I'm writing that down. Okay. She like, taps very slowly when she does tap, which is very nice. <laughs> I'm really into that. I feel I mean, I everyone talks so highly about it that I feel like it's something I should indulge in, but I just haven't yet. So um, and it's only gonna grow. The other question I have is. Poetry, I feel like, is this classic art form, but it also, you know, in keeping up with social media and new technology and all these things is evolving. Where do you think the world of poetry is going or where do you hope or what you hope happens in that field? I guess I just hope it feels more accessible to people. Mm. Like there's it feels like to me, poetry always has this weird gatekeeping vibe where it's like you have to be a certain kind of articulate to understand it or to to write it or and that's just not true like it's really for everyone and anyone can do it in their own authentic voice you know what I mean like whatever yeah. that sounds like is poetry like I said sometimes it's just like a language you make up for yourself yeah that other people get into and so I think I would just like it to feel more accessible and to not feel like this thing that is out of reach yeah I think that's what uh, intimidates me sometimes is my worry that I'm not getting the right message from a poem. Do you, I, I'm sure people have read your work and have gleaned different interpretations for themselves based on, you know, personal experiences or whatever. Does that excite you when you find that people are finding like different meanings than what you might have intended for your work? Absolutely. It's kind of cool to, to kind of let your work out of your hands yeah. and be like this, these poems, this book, um, it's not really mine anymore. So if mm. someone reads it and is like, oh, this is what I get from this book, they're not wrong. Um, you know cool. what I mean? Whatever their interpretation is, like it can't really be wrong, which is nice. I love that. Also, are there more books in place in the future? Are there more projects happening for you? There are. I don't even know. Like, you know, when you get, you sign a contract and you're like, can I talk about this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But there's definitely another book in place oh, and cool. another fun project that's going to be pretty audio based. Cool. So that's exciting. Very, very cool. Um, I know I feel you, but you're like, this is mine, but I don't know. Uh, I signed a <laughs> very professional document about it so i don't <laughs> like, know, I know it's do. happening <laughs> like, <laughs> take my word <laughs> okay we're gonna take one last break uh and when we get back we have a question from a listener that you and i can perhaps provide some guidance for so we'll be right back we're not too deep Okay, Sabrina, we were just talking offline a little bit about you read the audio version of your book. I and what's that process like for you, especially coming from the world of like slam poetry? Do you try to put performance into the reading or do you just kind of let it be what it is? That's that's kind of what I'm doing when I am performing is just mm -hmm. like trying to bring the poem to life and mm. let the performance sneak into the reading versus yeah. like focus on the performance only. Yeah. Um, I try to let the poem like 
do what it came to do on its own and then just embellish it as best as I can. Cool. So in the reading, that's, I didn't really practice too much. I read a few poems through just to make sure I knew how to pronounce things, which I still ended up pronouncing wrong when we were recording, <laughs> of course, yeah. um, like as one does, but yeah, I, I mostly just went for reading it with, um, some, Possess. <laughs> nice. Okay. So that is uh, available for people to get the audio audio version. Yes, Sweet. absolutely. It's going to be available on Audible and all those places. Sweet. Um, okay. Let's now get into answering or providing some sort of guidance um, for a listener that has written in this question is a little bit all over the place, but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a fun one. So bear with me here. Um, and this kind of happened in the past. So this situation is probably totally handled by now, but we'll pretend like this is very, very new. Um, okay. So this person writes, I'm currently icing my bruises from a drunken trip on asphalt last night. There's this guy who I met a few times who I like so much, his voice, his attitude, his intelligence, everything about him. I've tried subtly to flirt uh, with him in the past and it felt unrequited. So I decided to stop for the time being. He was traveling for a while. I was going to see him again last night. I pre-gamed too hard at my place and then had a bunch of drinks with him. I was a drunk mess. I slid off the bench we were sitting on and probably said some stupid shit. I realized my crush is stronger than ever and was going to finally make my move. I told him, okay, so you're my type and I think you're really cute. To which he replied, oh, wow, don't know what to say, which makes things clearer. I was also getting super jealous of the other guys flirting with him. My question is, should I completely avoid him to not constantly re-experience rejection even though he likes my company as a friend and this isn't his fault. P.S. The drunken fall in the asphalt happened, thankfully, after he left. This feels like a personal attack. <laughs> Did I write this question? Oh, no. Uh, I'm like, yeah, no, hang in there. Just keep doing what you're doing. Do that again. <laughs> Ask him one more time. <laughs> but this is a bit complicated because it's, so hard to disconnect, I think, from the feelings of liking someone and uh, hold on to even like the tiniest little grain of um, reciprocation, even if it's in platonic like friend form. And I don't like what's what's your thoughts on this? Um, have you seen the movie Sleeping with Other People? No, I haven't. OK, so there's a line in that movie where they say, I love you for free. So it's like, I will have these feelings for you without wanting anything back from you. Uh -huh. And I like really romanticize that concept in my life um, or have in the past. And I think that that's something that like you can take into platonic love very mm. easily. Like you can remind yourself that like friendship is a relationship still. And there's like love to be had platonically. Yeah. That is like free love. You know, you don't get anything in return for it other than friendship. There's no mm. like romantic. Is, you know, but same. as long as you're signing up to agree on your side that that's all you want from that person. Yeah, you kind of have to know you're not going to change their mind at any point. Yeah, I guess that's the tough uh, breaking point is realizing if you're if you're giving more than you're getting and nothing's really going to change. And are you really OK with that? Yeah. And also, like, is this person really your friend? Yeah, that's the other thing, too. You know? Like, uh, are you trying to hold on to a friendship idea when this person is trying not to be totally rejecting of you? Exactly. <laughs> it's just maybe a little bit nicer than you're, you thought. Yeah, I guess yeah. if I was in this situation, I think I would probably hang back from being the person to make the plans with this person. And if this person reached out to me to hang out, then I would consider it. But I wouldn't be, I think, jumping up to try and be the one being like, you like me as a friend. So let's keep hanging out when that secret voice in the back of my head would be like, you're going to get him to like you more than a friend if you keep hanging out. Yes. If I were learning from my mistakes, <laughs> then I would absolutely do the same or probably not even hang out with them. If they reached out to me, I would like give it a couple months of just like distance to get yeah. myself in a place where I felt better. Have you ever used 
poetry to get out of a sticky social situation? Um, in like, have you ever had to like write someone a note that was like, hey, I need to explain myself and here's the best way I can communicate how I'm feeling? Probably my whole first book was that. Um, like I, there was a, a, a person that I had had feelings for that didn't probably knew the whole time, but I had never expressed them. Mm. And so when I wrote the book, I had to have a drink with him and be like, Hey, you should read this. There's a lot about you. (laughs) That's huge though. Yeah. And so that was, but it was mostly like, I took real life and then like distorted it into art. So it wasn't. It wasn't like a diary or a biography in any way. So gotcha. he was okay with that. Did you have to do that for the new book? Did you have to give it to any family members, any friends, any um, love interest to say, is this okay? No, mostly just my mom. Um, when we were going through her diagnosis, I had to okay. kind of ask her, is it okay that I talk about this in real time? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. How has the feedback been so far since it's now out in the world a little bit? Yeah, so far it's been really good and I'm very, very excited. Oh, that's so great. I'm so excited for you. Um, Well, Sabrina, we've reached towards the end of the podcast. Um, You've told us that you have another book in the works and another potentially very cool project. Um, Before you go, we like to give everyone that has made time for us a little token of our appreciation. We have a personalized horoscope that we have written Um, for you that I believe Melissa will throw into the chat that if you're able to read it out loud to the class, that will be so lovely. I would love to. Dear Sagittarius, Archer of the Stars, whether you're single, dating, or completely in love, this is the perfect time to pursue any romance with confidence. Therefore, after you say, I love you, they most certainly will call back. Yeah, it must be right. We're uh, <laughs> it must be. We're post full moon right now, so all that new energy is coming to all of us. Um, Sabrina, where can people find you online and everything that you're up to? Where can they get the book if they don't know, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, most of my socials are at badass underscore sab. Love it. Um, yep, <laughs> you could find the book everywhere books are sold. Um, but I would say go to your favorite local bookstore and ask them to order it for you. And um, other than that, yeah, I'm just around the internet. Sweet. As one is these days. Love it. Well, congratulations, guys. Go get this book. Go feel some feels. Um, and potentially in the winter, maybe sign up for a class with Sabrina if you're interested in poetry at all, because it is not intimidating and it is for everyone. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Serena. This was great. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Of course. We'll see you guys next time on Not Too Deep. Goodbye. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Not too deep. It was Grace Helbig. Not Too Deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated. Producer Melissa D. Montz. Edited by Shireen Lani Yunus. Post-production sound by Chris Henry. And an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. <laughs>